War. What is it good for? War is good for business. War is a business. War puts things in a different perspective and also puts lots of people and companies in difficult positions, including the car industry. Many American car companies did business with German companies and vice versa, until someone higher up decided that these companies should not like each other anymore for whatever reason. But what happens when you play both sides of the fence? Welcome everyone to episode 60 of the Automotive History series, which is a deep and rather serious investigation in the actions the American car companies took with their overseas operations during the Second World War. How did they handle their conflicts of interest? Welcome to the American Nazi Car Connection. By the late 1920s, it became pretty clear which car companies would dominate the American car market. In fact, it were three companies. General Motors, Ford Motor Company and the Chrysler Corporation, or the Big Three. Especially GM and Ford eventually realized that they could sell the cars worldwide and started to aggressively expand their business through different tactics. Ford tried to sell the very popular Model T and Model A worldwide. As you'll probably know, the Model T was a massive success. And by the 1930s, Ford would sell unique car models better suited to the local tastes alongside American models. Rivaling General Motors had a different approach. By the 1910s, the company set up a new division called the Export Company that took care of worldwide sales and acquired new markets. GM would sell their American brands and models all over the world, but did not try to adapt them to local tastes. Instead, GM would buy out local car companies that already had some name and fame and sell non-American models through these companies. First, GM gained a foothold in the UK by acquiring Vauxhall in 1925, Opel in Germany was acquired by GM in 1929 and the Australian coach builder Holden was acquired in 1931. GM usually let these companies do their own thing, within reason, resulting in cars that suited the local market well, but with a bit of an American flair in its design. Around the time both Ford and GM had set up shop in Europe, things started to change. A man with a distinct mustache started to make noises. Before the all-out war, we will get there, don't worry, there was already a lot going on in Germany in the years leading up to 1940, although many leaders, analysts and newspapers around the world didn't think much of it. Hitler was a strong leader, with some daring and vocal opinions once in a while, but then there were some other European leaders doing the exact same thing, so no big deal. You'd think this would immediately put American car companies like Ford and General Motors that own German branches of Ford and Opel in a tough position. But it was quite the opposite, in fact. Before the war, these companies had very good relationship with the ever-growing Nazi movement. This led to certain situations that are, in retrospect, rather unfortunate. Like Hitler expressing his admiration for the American innovation and large-scale industrialization. He admired Henry Ford and his ideas about cars for the people. He also agreed with Henry Ford's anti-Semitic expressions. According to the stories, he had a picture of Henry in his office. And then there was James D. Mooney, Vice President of General Motors and tasked with guiding its overseas operations. He traveled all over Europe to make deals and explore new markets. Through this role, he eventually met high-level Nazi officials in the mid-1930s, where they would talk about what General Motors and its Opel division could mean to Germany in terms of creating a people's car. It was there where he received the Order of Merit of the Eagle, the highest order a foreigner could receive. And after receiving this award, Mooney was pushed forward as some sort of diplomat, trying to feel out the Germans on what their plans were and what it could mean for the United States in terms of trade. No, not war, trade. During these meetings, he met Hitler and reported back to the US president. By the start of the 1940s, it became pretty clear what Hitler's actual intentions were, and after a few annexations here and there, an all-out war broke out. The US's initial reaction was something along the lines of <sighs> not again, and we really don't want to get into this for a second time. But a surprise attack by the Japanese on Pearl Harbor changed this attitude, and the US officially declared war on Japan in December 1941, and Germany a few days later as a reaction to their declaration of war. 
Although the Nazis and the Americans were at war, business was still as usual. Nazi-American automotive relations remained positive in order to keep the investment secured and the production going. Both GM and Ford appointed several Nazi officials as part of the board of directors of the German plants, and also increased war material production while at the same time resisting to increase war material production back home. And yet, the companies had to give in eventually, when the US government ordered that regular passenger car production would be suspended and all production capacity would be used to make war material. Some 50,000 airplanes, 130,000 engines, 17,000 heavy guns and 25,000 light guns were produced in an effort to restore democracy in the world. And the American car companies were glad they could do it. They received millions of dollars in government war contracts and on top of that gained national pride and attention for helping so selflessly to win the war. They created what was called the Arsenal of Democracy. But these were the same companies that also produced what is called the arsenal of fascism. Both Ford and GM were deeply invested in making Nazi war material, and I'm just going to sum up a few things. General Motors and Exxon, the oil company, worked together to develop a synthetic fuel that was a great alternative for regular fuel, which really helped the Nazi troops on the move in a fuel-starved Germany. According to some, GM built bombers and jet planes that were regarded as the most important for the Nazi army. Ford used slave laborers, usually prisoners of war, in the German factories. And arguably the face of it all, and what is also featured in the thumbnail, is the Opel Blitz truck. Although the truck was made well before the war had started, it can be considered as the backbone of the Nazi war machine. All in all, considering the total production output of the American car companies in Nazi Germany, some critics went so far to say that Hitler couldn't have invaded Poland and Russia without Ford and GM. And the war could have been fought without Hitler, but not without Ford and GM. Back in the USA, the American car companies retained their image as the effortless heroes of the war. The boys overseas were doing great with their Cadillac-powered tanks, Willys Jeep and airplanes produced by the Dodge factory in Chicago, and could not do it without their wonderful machinery. And yet, something seemed off. Imagine being an American soldier, fighting your way from Normandy far into German territory. You've seen so many abandoned German tanks, jeeps and guns along the way. You've explored them. And you found that the mechanicals under the hood are oddly similar to what your tank has. You finally reach Russelheim, only to find a factory left in ruins. Forced laborers behind barbed wire that don't speak German but praise Hitler anyway. And an assembly line full of unfinished opals, powered by what seems, once again, familiar technology. You decide to check out the factory's main office, and among the debris and burned documents, you find a letter. That letter has the GM logo all over it. Something doesn't add up. So, to put it very bluntly and oversimplified, the short story regarding the Second World War is this. Germany is bad, the USA is good. And the USA won the war thanks to the unlimited help of the American car industry. Along with the soldiers, they are the true heroes of the war. This industry had no involvement in the German side of things whatsoever, as they had to give all their interest and control away to the Nazi suppressors. End of story. But this is a fairy tale. Allow me to guide you once again through the timeline of the Second World War and the time thereafter, and look at how the American car companies handle their conflicts of interest. As mentioned earlier in the video, by the mid-1930s many people didn't think much of what went on in Germany and what that meant for American car companies. In fact, there were talks where American businesses could help shaping the Third Reich and make some money off of it on the side. This sentiment quickly changed by the start of the 1940s, when Hitler started to show his true color, like annexing countries, rolling into countries uninvited and his anti-Semitic views. With this in mind, some people started to connect the dots that this would also influence American companies doing business with the Germans, like GM and Ford. And so every so often, the government, institutions and journalists would ask difficult questions. And so what was their first reaction? Denial. 
As much as you cannot hide the fact that the Führer himself gave you the highest award possible, you can deny any other accusations. And so the American car companies denied any involvement in Germany. Detroit and Dearborn had nothing to do with Rasselheim and Cologne. When the war finally broke out between the United States and Germany, the criticism regarding the overseas operations of the American car brands grew stronger. But their second reaction softened a bit. Instead of fully denying that they had no influence on German war production, they admitted that they did profit from doing business with the Nazis, but in the all-American way. This was not a matter of war, this was a matter of business. Strictly business. Or as Alfred P. Sloan, president of GM, liked to call it, sound business practice. And who doesn't like to make a quick buck? The American car companies took the stance of, we are in no position to either condone or criticize the way the German government acts. It's not in our interest, nor the right time or place to You know, that kind of stuff. And they better not criticize the man with the mustache or they would lose their multi-million dollar investments. As the war progressed and became more ugly, the US government forbade American car companies to have any contact with their operations on German territory. This once again changed their narrative. Not only did they use this reason to show that they had nothing to do with it, even if they did have something to do with it, General Motors and Ford started to share the message that their hands were simply tied. The Nazis had gained full control over the overseas operations and they had no influence over it anymore. This is simply a lie. Leaked documents reported that the American stake in overseas operations had decreased and Nazis had gained a controlling interest. But it were the same Nazis that preferred not to gain complete control, arguing that Opel and German Ford were so well managed by the Americans, it would only slow down production if they were kicked out entirely. It was in both parties' best interest if there was still some form of American control. When the war was finally over, the cover-up story changed once again. In a whirl of celebration, relief and joy that the war was over, the American car companies stepped forward, thumping their chest, priding themselves that they were in fact the true heroes of the war. The boys fighting over there in Europe couldn't have done it without their many tanks, jeeps and planes. In fact, not only were they the heroes, but also the victims. Whose foreign factories all over Europe were blown to pieces during the war? Right, those of the American car companies. That these same factories produced war material used against those fighting for the good cause, well, that was conveniently forgotten. And the US government agreed, as American car companies asked, no, demanded, to be paid millions of dollars so that they could rebuild their factories which they lost during the war. Still, when the war ended, there were a few American politicians and journalists that once again started to ask questions about their influence during the war. They were quickly hushed, however, because who is going to nitpick about these details in times of celebration? Let the past be the past. What happened, happened. And wouldn't it be a rather weird move by the US government to suddenly backstep the auto industry by starting to openly criticize their overseas motives? They were the heroes that brought victory out. After all, it was once again in both parties' best interest to keep up the good show. And so, the criticism of playing both sides by the American car industry fell silent in the post-war years. We should all forget about the horrors of the war, look forward and embrace the future. And in many ways, the American car industry certainly embraced the future. From what I could find, it would take another 20 years or so before some agencies started to demand answers on difficult questions again. In 1974, an investigation was carried out by the US Senate Monopoly and Antitrust Subcommittee. A few articles were written about this trail, which also brought some new details to the table as mentioned in this video. The investigation was based on federal documents and reports floating around in various archives, as getting information directly from the source, the US car makers, was almost impossible. Many representatives were not available for commentary, plenty of reports were suddenly lost, and not to mention that the companies hired armies of lawyers and self-proclaimed automotive historians that would rewrite the company's history and defend the new narrative. This investigation brought up new revealing and confronting details about the wartime practice. And what was GM's reaction? 
a three-sentence denial. It was the same story all over again. The Nazis took complete control over the Opel factories and there was no influence from GM whatsoever. GM also accused other companies for doing the exact same thing and therefore the charges made by the committee was nothing more than a direct and almost personal attack on GM, according to GM. The last sign of trying to get a clear view of what happened during the war came around the new millennium. A fund established to compensate those who suffered from the Holocaust set out to accuse various companies, including banks, oil industries and the car industry. Think of looted art, unpaid insurance benefits and the use of forced labor in factories. Both German and American car brands were accused and paid settlements that went to former prisoners of war and those that were affected by the Holocaust. One could say that the American car companies finally gave in and revealed some of their secrets. Although this reveal came with an air of why would you start nagging us again about something that happened so long ago and as of today nobody's actively involved in anymore. I want to end this story with zooming out a bit. As a car enthusiast channel, I very much focused on the American car companies during the Second World War, and I usually talk about cars, but this time it's a bit more about the business practices. But this video is not a direct accusation or another way to shit on GM and Ford like I usually do in some of my videos. And although they've been very naughty during these years, you cannot blame them entirely. You should remember that there were loads of other big businesses that profited heavily from the war by playing on both sides. Think of the American oil companies that provided resources for the Nazi war machines, or American or even European banks helping the Nazis through blurry financial schemes, allowing them to secretly push money around. And I'm sure that on the German side there were also plenty of companies that made shady deals with the American companies in order to either help or sabotage the Nazi regime. And I have no real nice way to end this video. Uh, but most of you know that the Second World War remains a heavy topic with many awful details. So let me end this video by repeating the same message I started with because I think it, especially right now, it's more relevant than ever. War is a business.